Hi everyone. So let's let's start uh, the webinar. Sorry for this short for this short uh, delay. So um, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll be talking about the EU regulation, of course, today. Um, first and foremost, I will do a very very short presentation of uh, Aden and uh, and what we do. So Aden is a, an industry body that brings together and represents digital assets and blockchain professionals in France and Europe. We have uh, 45 members and our objective is of course to develop all uh, the crypto assets industry in Europe because we believe that uh, digital assets are a transformational shift in finance and economics and that can bring a huge value to all the markets in France and Europe. Uh, we wish to be a very pragmatic voice uh, for the French and European industry. And in this regard, uh, we do a lot of uh, initiatives for education and um, sharing our vision of the digital assets and what it can become. Um, we are a small team of three employees, uh, but Elan has 45 active members and we uh, oh, we operate since uh, January this year. Uh, so I'm the, the president of Eden, uh, Simon. Uh, today we will uh, we we will present with uh, Faustine, um, who is uh, chief of uh, uh, chief of uh, institutional relationships. Um, this new text that has been uh, presented two weeks ago now by the by the eu um, by the <clears throat> sorry by the eu commission and we will basically do an overview of the text at first um, with the main um, the, the main uh, the main issues that we see the main points uh, and who will be covered who, what are the assets that will be covered etc cetera, etc cetera. And then we will do an assessment. Uh, what are the potential shortcomings of this text? Uh, what are our proposals? And we will finish the presentation with a Q&A. Uh, so open floor for everyone to ask questions on the regulation. So uh, we have a lot of things to say. So without further ado, let's begin directly with the overview. And for this, I will share the yeah, it's first in talking. Hi, everyone. So thank you very much for uh, being here today uh, for this webinar. And uh, as uh, Simon said, let's start with the very basics of the EU regulations that uh, we could discover two weeks ago only <laughs> uh, regarding crypto assets. Uh, actually, this uh, regulation, this EU regulation for uh, crypto assets uh, is based on two uh, draft uh, regulations uh, that we will familiarly call MICA and uh, the pilot regime. Uh, Mika for markets in crypto asset uh, regulation and the pirate regime for DLT market infrastructures. We we'll see that it's all about uh, security tokens here. So those two texts uh, were released by the European Commission uh, to set a framework for crypto assets uh, with uh, one uh, general principle that is uh, crypto asset activities uh, are prohibited unless you uh, you comply with uh, the requirements set by the Commission. Uh, so, who and what is uh, on the EU radar in those two uh, two texts? Uh, the general principle is that uh, market participants are regulated and not the assets. Uh, so the market participants that are targeted here can be split between three main targets. Uh, first, the issuers of crypto assets, uh, what we call the primary markets. Then uh, who the people who provide services uh, on the secondary markets of crypto assets that, uh, that cover the lots of uh, activities from the exchanges uh, to custodians, but we also have, for example, the advice on crypto assets. Uh, and finally, uh, for security tokens, the trading and post-trading infrastructures, uh, what we call the multi a multilateral trading facility, a central security depository, and the security supplement services. 
So those are the three main uh, types of participants that the EU want to regulate through uh, the two proposals that uh, they release. Uh, whatever the crypto asset is, because they set a, a broad definition of what is a crypto asset, saying that this is a digital representation of value or rights, which may be transferred and stored digitally using DLT or similar technology. So in this uh, definition, we understand that this includes utility tokens, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, and security tokens, even if cryptocurrencies are never mentioned by uh, the commission in the text. Uh, to the contrary, this definition excludes what is called e-money, deposits, structured deposits, and securitization. So a very large uh, scope of, uh, of crypto assets uh, in this uh, regulation. We said that the general principle uh, followed by the Commission was to regulate participants and not assets. There are some exceptions uh, because there are specific rules that apply to security tokens and stable coins. Security tokens, because they are not regulated under the MICA te text that regulate all other kinds of crypto assets. They are explicitly excluded from this text uh, and they uh, are regulated under the existing uh, rules that apply to uh, financial uh, instruments. So they cannot be listed by the new actors that will be regulated uh, under the MICA regulation. Uh, for crypto assets that are not security tokens. Uh, to the contrary, uh, they will be able to benefit from the pilot regime, uh, while other crypto assets will not be able to, to benefit from this. And we will um, explain later what means uh, a pilot regime for security tokens. The second type of uh, assets uh, that get specific rules and we can understand why, because we spoke a lot about them for, uh, for nearly one year and a half now, is stable coins. Uh, even if they are not called stable coins uh, in, the, in the European Commission's uh, proposals, uh, they are called asset reference tokens and e-money tokens. We will explain later what are the differences between the two uh, types of stable coins. But the main uh, thing to understand is that they have um, very strong rules uh, regarding their issuance, their listing and their maintenance, even stronger than, than other crypto assets. Uh, for e-money tokens, uh, they, are, they have a ban uh, from the EU if rules are uh, not followed, that is different from other crypto assets and the other type of stable coins. And there is a new qualification for those stable coins that do not apply to other crypto assets is the significant uh, qualification and we will see also later what it means for a stable coin to be a significant so even if we have those uh, crypto assets this white uh, definition of crypto assets and even if the principle is to regulate uh, participants uh, finally you have some specificities depending on which crypto assets you are uh, talking about that's why it's quite a complicated landscape of regulations uh, that arise uh, from the, the European Commission's publication uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we tried to illustrate uh, this, um, this wide landscape, uh, trying to graduate uh, for each uh, activity and crypto asset uh, if the rules are deemed to be light or stronger. So you can see from one type of uh, activity to another one, uh, the the burden of regulation goes to what we can say light to strong, uh, and we try to be uh, to to draw those uh, regulatory bricks uh, so we can understand what actors will need to comply with when uh, in order to uh, operate on the markets of uh, crypto assets. So here all are all the possible uh, regulatory bricks uh, that the crypto asset actors could uh, face. Uh, so we have the MICA rules that you can see in orange. What, is, uh, what comes from the existing regulations uh, in uh, green? Uh, the possible supervisions that, uh, that they can, um, the possible supervision of those crypto assets in blue. 
and the uh, DORA requirements uh, that are all about, all about um, cyber uh, resilience, security, and integrity. So for example, if we take utility tokens and cryptocurrencies, uh, you can see which rules will apply to, uh, for example, the issuers of crypto assets. They will need to apply NECA. If you want to provide services on those utility tokens and cryptocurrency, you will need to apply the set of rules to crypto asset uh, uh, service provider and market abuses rules. You will be uh, supervised by your national competent authority, NCA, and you will need to apply uh, the DORA uh, new text about uh, cybersecurity. If you take significant e-money token, uh, this is the, uh, the most burdensome uh, activity uh, that, uh, that we could find by analyzing the DEX. So you, if you are an issuer, you have many rules applying to the issuance of money, e-money tokens and additional rules because they are significant. If you want to provide services on, uh, on uh, those uh, e-money tokens, you need to comply with the MICA rules that are uh, uh, that goes with the crypto asset service uh, providers, the market abuses rules, but you also have all the uh, existing regulation that apply uh, regarding electronic money and payment services. You have a shared supervision uh, both by your national competent authority, but also by the European Banking uh, Authority. And of course, you must apply the, the, DORA, the DORA requirements. Uh, last example uh, before we go to the next part of this presentation for security tokens uh, it's quite easy because security tokens are financial instruments then they must apply actors on security tokens must apply uh, financial regulations so the MIFID to MIFID regime CSDR and the traditional market abuse uh, package and you are uh, the actor is authorized by his national competent authority uh, so we'll see later that security tokens can benefit from exemptions, but this is the um, this is the uh, main landscape for them. So you can see it's quite burdensome also. So here that, uh, for the um, for the basics of the regulation. Now we will go a little bit deeper on what it means for actors, and for this I let uh, Simon uh, start. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, so we start uh, first. First and foremost, I would just uh, say that, of course, we will not be exhaustive uh, on this uh, uh, on this uh, overview of the text. We'll go deeper and see what are the main obligations for each kind of uh, actor, and also the consequences that it could have on their activities. Um, but of course, we, we, we just listed what we deemed significant as obligations, and uh, there's a lot of uh, more fine-tuned um, things in the text that are not as uh, significant as, uh, as, as what we listed there. So um, let's begin with the crypto assets insurers. Uh, basically, crypto assets issuers are any uh, legal person who will offer to the public any kind of crypto asset or seek the admission of these crypto assets to a trading platform. Um, so if you, uh, so it's either one or the other, you will fall into the definition if you are one of those two things. And uh, the offer to the public is defined as an offer to third parties to acquire a crypto asset in exchange for fiat currency or other crypto assets. So here we have two uh, things that, that comes to mind immediately, that uh, it's only for legal persons, which means that the natural persons that are not, uh, uh, that are not constituted as a, as a company uh, are not in the scope of the text. Uh, and the offer to the public is only where you exchange against fiat or, or the crypto assets, which means also that if you accept other things as a mean of payment, uh, then you are not in the scope of the text. And the thing is, um, assets whose issuance is out of the scope uh, are 
probably prohibited to be listed. That's our understanding of the text, and maybe it needs to be clarified, but are probably prohibited from to be listed by you, crypto asset service provider, because on the due diligence, and we'll see this more in more details later, but the due diligence is that uh, a EO crypto asset service provider needs to do when listing a new crypto asset include make sure that there is a white paper. But of course, if you are out of the scope, then uh, you are not in this uh, specific definition of a white paper. So that, that's something we will, we will go deeper uh, later, but that's, that's the first uh, thing that, that comes to mind when we, when we read the definitions. And then let's go to the uh, obligations. So the principle is that um, if you don't, do, so you, your operation is prohibited. A, unless you comply with Mika. So um, you are not allowed to do a public sale of tokens of any crypto assets if you do not comply with Mika. Um, so it's a very restrictive regime. It's not uh, the same as what was um, implemented in France where the uh, ICO regime is uh, purely optional. Here we have really something that applies to all the operations. Um, and your main obligations are listed there. There's five main obligations. The first one is to be a legal entity, of course, because you are a legal person. So, yeah, it's quite, uh, it's a repetition. Uh, you need uh, to draft a white paper, which, which content is specified in the regulation. So the content, every single section of your white paper is defined. It's not detailed here, but uh, uh, it's on the regulation. You need to notify this white paper to the competent authorities. You need to publish it, of course, to the to the people who will, uh, so that all the people who are uh, participating to the sale can can read it. And you need to comply uh, with a few additional obligations that ensure integrity and honesty of the issuer, i.e., yourself, um, so that uh, you're not lying in the white paper, basically. The specificity is that uh, there's a few exclusions uh, on those obligations. So two to five are not applicable where you offer those assets for free being uh, specified that for free means that it's not an exchange of any kind of service it's really for free uh, are automatically created through mining with a very uh, mining is not defined here so it's not uh, if mining includes staking uh, but uh, at least mining uh, like in a proof of work uh, blockchain should exclude you um, if you if you um, of, of the, the dispositions um, if your uh, asset is an nft so if it is an object uh, presented on blockchain so if it's a uh, non-fungible if your asset is offered to less than 150 persons per member state so you know each member state you can have 150 uh, subscribers and then you are exempt for uh, the white paper obligation um, if you sell them for uh, less than 1 million euro uh, for each 12 months period because you can have long uh, ICOs and if you only offer them to qualified investors and uh, it can and it can only be held by such so it's it's not sufficient to only offer them to qualified investors. You also need to make sure that only uh, qualified investors can uh, can keep them. So that's the, the main obligations. There's a few other ones. I will I won't uh, dwell too much into the details, but uh, the marketing material is regulated. Uh, if your sale is limited in time, then you you have to publish the results uh, soon after the end of the sale. Uh, maybe one significant thing is that there's a right of withdrawal. So may, uh, or the, the consumers uh, can change their mind for 14 days uh, after the, the, they bought the product, except if the product is already listed, uh, of course, because the, the, then the price will change. Um, you cannot exclude, <laughs> exclude your own civil liability from the sale uh, terms, of course. And you, of, you need to monitor and safeguard the funds. So that, that those are quite obvious. Uh, except for the right of withdrawal, which, which is quite uh, significant because it was not clear uh, as for now. Um, but those are those are the other uh, most important uh, obligations that I can that I can list. And then um, I think that that's it for crypto assets. Do, do we have an, another slide? I don't think so.
no, we'll go to, to stable coins. So that, that's it for the main overview of the of the issues. We 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 will get back to um, what what we feel are, are maybe uh, um, the things are missing or or, or, this, or where the scope is uh, is is a bit uh, difficult to understand later when we will uh, do the the assessment of the text. But uh, so back to first in for stablecoin issuers. So yeah, let's go back to stablecoin. Uh, as we said at the very beginning, stablecoins are regulated under the Mika uh, regime for crypto assets. But stablecoins are never called stablecoins. They are uh, split between two types of tokens, that are asset reference tokens and e-money tokens. So the common uh, criteria to, to be a stablecoin, as you say, is to maintain a stable value. Uh, but you have now differences between those two kinds of tokens. For the first one, asset reference tokens, here are all the stable coins which are which refer to, or which are backed on uh, several fiat currencies or crypto assets or commodities or a combination of um, all or, par or parts of those uh, assets. So when uh, your uh, underlying uh, the underlying asset are this. You are uh, your token is qualified as uh, asset reference token. Uh, so what is important? Yes, is the reference price. Uh, uh, that is what uh, what are the asset that referred that um, that refer to this um, to this asset. Uh, in if you are not an asset reference token, you may fall in the e money tokens. What are the criteria to fall in this definition? Uh, you, have, you, you are a stable coin, so you must uh, maintain a stable value. But the other uh, main uh, function, I would say, uh, of e-money tokens is to be a means of exchange. Uh, and the other criteria is that uh, you uh, maintain a stable value by referring to the value of one fiat currency that is a legal tender. So when you are, you can be an asset reference token if you refer to several fiat currencies. But if you refer to the value of one legal currency, you are an e-money token. Uh, so the, the implication is quite hard because when you qualify as an e-money token, you also qualify are as e-money, electronic money, which is an already existing uh, legal concept and that makes you fall in uh, many other uh, existing regulation uh, apart from the, MICA the new MICA regulation. So as uh, we already said, the principle is uh, always the same. Uh, the issuance of stablecoin is prohibited. That's uh, the main uh, principle. Unless uh, the issuer of the stablecoin complies with uh, MICA requirements. So. Uh, for all type of stable coins, asset reference stable coins uh, or e-money uh, tokens, you have a common set of rules that apply. The issuer must be a legal entity. Uh, he must uh, produce and notify white paper to its uh, national competent authority and is liable for the information that he gives in this white paper. Uh, and for on uh, all stable coins, interests are prohibited. So holders of stable coins cannot be uh, cannot benefit from uh, any interest. Otherwise, the uh, token, the stable coin, would be prohibited by uh, the European Union. And finally, uh, if your stable coin asset reference or money is uh, qualified as significant, uh, the issuer will need to comply with the, an additional set of rules. Uh, so this is a common package for all stablecoins. Uh, as an issuer of stablecoins, you can uh, maybe be exempted from this uh, package. If you, the issuance size of the stablecoins is lower than uh, 5 billion dollars, or as for the issuance of any kind of uh, crypto assets, the stablecoins are offered to qualified investors and Cannot, can only be held by those uh, qualified investors. Uh, one, uh, one other exclusion is uh, regarding finally the uh, innovative actors because uh, for e-money tokens, the only way 
to be able to be authorized to issue the money token is to be a regulated entity already, either a credit institution or a, a e money institution. So uh, we spoke about the common set of rules for all stable coins. You also have rules that apply um, requirements that must apply to issuers of, uh, of stable coins. Uh, and that are specific if the stablecoin is an asset reference token or an electronic money token. So be, being quite fast about it, uh, if your token is an asset reference token, you have some governance requirements, uh, requirements uh, regarding the reserve of assets. Uh, for example, you cannot invest, invest the reserve assets in uh, all the assets that you want. There are some restrictions. Uh, you have a, a information requirement for your holders, of course, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for e-money tokens, uh, that, that's maybe something that uh, uh, it's not written. But because the issuer is uh, must be a credit institution and an e-money institution, and because the electronic money tokens is um, is an electronic money, uh, what is specific to them is that they must apply the e-money directive and uh, related requirements of the, uh, the payment services uh, directive also. Uh, the e-money token uh, is banned unless uh, it is a claim on the issuer. If it's not, uh, it is completely prohibited. It must be issued at par value and on the receipt of funds. Also redeemable at par. Uh, and whenever the holders uh, require it, uh, and as for asset reference token, uh, the investment of funds is restricted uh, in, um, in uh, some kind of assets, uh, especially those that are low risk, secure, uh, and they must be denominated in the same currency as the one referenced by the uh, e-money token. Uh, at the very beginning, I also introduced the qualification of significant stablecoin. Uh, finally, you may better understand if I say that significant stablecoin refers to uh, the global stablecoin uh, concept that we hear for, uh, for months now uh, regarding, for example, the, the Libra project. That what the, this global uh, stablecoin concept is finally uh, transcripted in the MICA regulation under the uh, significant uh, concept. Uh, so your stablecoin, uh, as we could see, uh, if you are an issuer of stablecoin, you have a set of rules to apply, uh, so you are allowed to issue. Uh, but you have additional rules if your stablecoin is uh, uh, deemed to be significant. How uh, to know if your stablecoin is uh, significant? Uh, actually, the uh, European Commission set uh, some criteria uh, to, uh, to assess uh, the significant uh, qualification. Uh, and if you know a little bit about the banking regulation, you will see uh, quite fast that it is inspired from the financial stability board criteria regarding systemic banks. Uh, so if you meet three uh, or more criteria among the six criteria that are defined, your stablecoin uh, qualify as significant. And if you look at those criteria, you can see that it's really easy to uh, meet them. For example, uh, the market cap that must be uh, that if it is uh, um, higher than 1 billion, you uh, can be significant. Uh, the size of the reserve assets also uh, higher than 1 billion. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, or, or the case if you must uh, register to issue your stable coins. Uh, and uh, your stable coin, if it's uh, used in more than seven countries, it is also a criteria that can be considered to qualify that significant. And this is actually the case for the main uh, stable coins that we know. So uh, when you look at those criteria, it seems that many, many stable coins will qualify as significant. But if you, you have the chance to not to fall in the significant qualification, the text, the European Commission, text um, allows you to voluntarily 
ask for the qualification of significance. So don't worry if you don't meet those, uh, those criteria. But what does it mean if you are uh, see if you issue a significant stable coins, you must uh, comply with additional rules, uh, higher funds uh, requirements. You must implement a remuneration policy uh, that comply with the MICA rules. Uh, you must implement liquidity management policy and procedures, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is common to all kinds of stable coins. And if your stablecoin is an e-money uh, token, you also have some requirements regarding the reserve assets and the plan to uh, the orderly wind down of, uh, of the issuer's activities. Uh, what can be noticed is that those uh, two requirement, additional requirements for e-money tokens are actually um, requirements that are already uh, in the set of rules of normal asset reference tokens. So as you can see, it's a, quite, uh, it's a quite complicated and burdensome regime that was established uh, for stable coins and uh, significant stable coins. So here we are for the stable coins and maybe we're not sure better, better news for crypto asset service uh, provider. Thank you, Faustine. Um, so yeah, let's let's uh, go into uh, the service providers. So uh, that was the original idea, right? To to go with the actors and not the assets. So we we um, we see that there's a lot of rules for stable coins, but um, the first idea was really to to regulate the the actors themselves. So CASPs, uh, it's the European definition of um, the service providers that are touching crypto assets. It's a new term because the, the international uh, term uh, was usually uh, VASP, like uh, virtual asset service providers, but um, it's basically the same idea. So a crypto asset service provider is basically any person whose occupation or business is the provision of one or more crypto asset services to third parties on a professional basis. So as soon as you provide those services uh, to third parties uh, on a professional basis, you are uh, in the scope of the crypto asset service provider. There's a, a list of uh, activities that uh, accompany uh, the, the, the main definition. So of course, if you do the custody and administration of crypto assets on behalf of third parties, you fall into the definition. If you operate a trading platform, if you exchange crypto assets uh, for others uh, against fiat currency or against other crypto assets, uh, if you execute orders uh, for crypto assets on behalf of third parties, if you place crypto assets, if you uh, do the reception and transmission of orders for crypto assets, on behalf of third parties, and if you provide advice on crypto assets, provide advice on crypto assets is quite a large, uh, of course, uh, activity. Um, and if you fall, um, and yeah, and uh, a, a third one principle. So the first principle is that uh, all those actors need to be regulated, and the second principle is that uh, all those actors have uh, banned are prohibited for trading some assets. Uh, so. You can list all the crypto assets except uh, assets first that do not comply with Mika, which means that are issued with no white paper that do not re respect the uh, the issuance rules of Mika. This includes, uh, for example, assets that would be generated by protocols in remuneration of a service. Uh, that would include, for example, asset, assets issued with a, a smart contract by the final user. Uh, because you are a natural person and then you cannot you are not in the scope of the regulation um that that that's that's well it's need to be clarified but that, that's where we we've seen some uh, some uh, some some uh, some examples um and then if you are an asset back token or any money token and do not comply with specific rules of course uh, you are uh, banned to be listed on uh, on uh, the trading platforms in the in the EU, and there's a second broad category of assets that are banned. Uh, those are the anonymous enhanced assets. So it's a very broad uh, ban that basically you uh, you cannot admit to trading crypto assets which have inbuilt anonymization function, 
unless the holders of the crypto assets and the transaction history can be identified by the crypto asset service providers. Uh, which, which seems quite uh, in opposition like uh, to the, the, the function of the functioning, the, the basis functioning of those uh, uh, anonymous uh, crypto assets, right? If, you, if they're anonymous, of course, you cannot uh, assess their transaction history. Uh, which means uh, that basically anonymous enhanced assets like Monero, Zcash, Dash, etc. are uh, banned, banned by default, uh, irrespective of their origin and of who uh, brings them and of the amount, etc. Et so it's basically rules that are uh, harsher than, than the cash for, for the banks. Um, so that's for the ban of some, of some assets. Um, and now let's move back to the last section of the uh, this overview of the regulation, um, talking about security tokens and uh, Faustine. Yes, so for the moment we described um, the MICA rules that apply to crypto assets. And at the beginning we said that security tokens uh, even if they are crypto assets, are not regulated under MICA, but at their financial instruments, they fall in the financial regulations. Uh, but uh, the European Commission released uh, its project for a pilot regime for a DLT market infrastructure. So what is a pilot regime? Uh, this pilot regime is supposed to grant permission to what uh, they call DLT market infrastructures. Uh, permission to be exempted from some rules that uh, would apply to them because they, uh, those actors uh, must comply with financial regulation. So you have this uh, existing regulation and the pilot regime enables you to ask if you can uh, circumvent some of uh, the rules uh, that apply to you. To this end, you, may, you have two steps to follow. First, if you want to benefit, if you want to have the chance to uh, benefit from those uh, permission, you must be a, a regulated entity. Uh, it means that if you are not a regulated entity under MIFID II or CSDR, you uh, cannot operate uh, on security markets. So you must first uh, comply with the MIFID II requirements or the CSDR requirements to uh, become a DLT market infrastructure and to be able to operate on security markets. And at this stage, uh, if you are a regulated entity, you have the right to uh, be an actor of security token, token uh, but you must apply the whole uh, EU financial package of regulations. The second step, if you want to benefit from those exemptions, uh, is to comply with the pilot regime uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, we won't go uh, in the details of those uh, conditions, uh, but this could uh, enable you to circumvent some rules like um, you could be able to, to, um, to admit to trading uh, security tokens even when they are not recording in the central security depository. Uh, you could be able to give a direct access to your platform or your settlement system to a natural person because under the existing regulation, it's uh, only uh, possible for uh, some legal persons like companies or uh, regulated entities. Uh, and uh, if you benefit from uh, this exemption, you could also be uh, authorized to settle your transaction in e-money tokens. Of course, it is not possible under the current uh, financial rules. Uh, so those, uh, if you follow those two steps, maybe you have the chance to, uh, to benefit from a lighter uh, financial regulation. Uh, what happened next? Uh, in five years, the European Commission will uh, assess uh, the results of this uh, pilot regime and decide if this would be permanent, meaning that those exemptions will be uh, uh, will uh, stay uh, forever, I would say. Uh, if this pilot regime uh, must be amended, if it must be extended for uh, some additional years, uh, or if it must be arrested, and uh, maybe uh, maybe a crypto actors uh, on security token will need to comply with the whole financial package uh, 
uh, of regulation uh, uh, after this pilot regime. So we don't really know now, and uh, we we must uh, wait five years to to be sure of the final regime applying to security token. What we are sure for the moment is that even if this pilot regime uh, is a very good uh, uh, starting point, it is very restrictive because uh, the, uh, the scope of entities uh, and securities that can be um, in this pilot regime is very limited uh, because those, uh, the securities that are emitted in this pilot regime are only shares and uh, bonds that are under uh, some uh, threshold. And as you could see, uh, this only, uh, for entities, this only uh, concerns uh, the exchanges and uh, the uh, central security depository. So there is nothing about all other uh, investment uh, services. And the possible exemption uh, that, uh, that you can benefit thanks to this pilot regime, are also quite uh, limited. Uh, and we spoke about the, the main one just before. So that is for the pilot regime. I hope you would understand uh, a little bit well. And now let's go to, um, after the theory, uh, the practice. Uh, so you, so uh, we finally really understand what it implies for actors. Thank you very much, uh, Faustine. So uh, yeah, just before going to in practice, uh, I, I, uh, there was a, a slight uh, error in the in the slides. There's a slide that was missed. So can you just uh, go back uh, a few slides before? So one one more. Yeah. Okay. So no, you don't have the the last version. Well, anyways. So go go back to in practice. Uh, we will move forward. It's just that we are missing the the conditions for being a CASP. Um, but we'll we'll uh, send the final uh, the final version with all the the slides uh, just after the the, uh, the webinar, uh, and then uh, in those slides, anyways, there's a, a very a short summary of those obligations. So um, yeah, the idea of those uh, of this table is to um, go into the practical uh, consequences for actual uh, actors, and. Those are only uh, a few examples, but this is our understanding of what would be the consequences of the regulation if it had, if it was applied today. Of course, uh, there's still room for amendments uh, on the regulation, but um, those are the, the rules that are uh, set, set in the project. So for the crypto assets trading platform, so basically, uh, if you go to Paymium, you go to Bitcoin.de, you go to Bitstamp, and you want to buy uh, crypto assets and sell them, what those platforms need to do to comply? Uh, first, they will need to comply with all the CASPs operating rules. So they, there's rules uh, on uh, the way uh, they, they operate, uh, so they, they need to act honestly, fairly, and professionally. Let's hope they already do this. Uh, they have prudential. They will have prudential requirements. They will need. They will have organizational requirements. So they must organize the, uh, the, the, the functioning in specific uh, ways. And of course, they must apply market abuse rules. We have uh, already uh, said, said it at the beginning of the presentation. Um, but then they will also need to de delist all the tokens that are not compliant with Mika. Uh, which probably includes def DeFi tokens and stable coins, uh, most stable coins today actually. Uh, they will need to stop serve interest on compliant stable coins, even if they are compliant, uh, because the interest are, are prohibited in any case. Uh, and they will need to file, of course, an approval request to its national competent authorities with, with a full file uh, de describing how they will comply with all those operating rules and wait for approval. Uh, being uh, so the, the full process for approval should take approximately three months. Um, for a traditional financial actor, so uh, um, um, a platform that already exists and that already uh, provides uh, like an MTF, for example. Um, there's, a, there's an exception, actually. You don't need to uh, ask for CASP rules, uh, for CASP uh, validation of your, your, of, your, of your business plan or operating rules, etc. You just need to comply with the rules. Uh, there's an equivalence. So as soon as the regulation will enter into, uh, uh, 
into force, traditional financial actors will be able to list uh, all the crypto assets they want in their platforms. For the DeFi stablecoin, uh, that's a, a, a tough one uh, because uh, you are, of course, an e-money token because of the specific definition of e-money token that en encompasses all the tokens that try to replicate the price of a fiat currency, which is obviously the case of a DAI. Um, but the the obligations we've seen uh, in, for the e-money tokens are, of course, uh, difficult to uh, to implement for a token that is uh, created by natural persons, right? You cannot be uh, even an institution if you are a natural person. Uh, so those tokens will more likely than not be uh, banned from being listed by a CASP in Europe. Um, this is something that needs, of course, to be clarified and we hope that uh, this will change. But for now, this is, this is our pre preliminary conclusion. Um, this is the same for governance tokens um, that uh, you know are issued in DeFi applications. Um, those are crypto assets, so it's a, a different set of rules. But again, if you do not respect the issuance uh, rules of those um, uh, of, uh, set forth by the regulation, i.e., the white paper um, uh, being uh, being created by a legal entity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, then you are banned from being listed in a CASP. So. Uh, Again, this is the risk that we see uh, with the current regulation that uh, those assets will be banned from being listed. Uh, what are the consequences for asset-backed stablecoins? Um, so stablecoins that are backed by a uh, reserve of assets. Um, so with the example I, I, I'm taking here is the USDT with a market cap of uh, uh, 15 billion USD uh, will of course be a significant e-money token and I won't list all the obligations um, but you see that they are quite numerous uh, the issue is will, will of course need to be authorized as a credit institution as an e-money institution they will need to own funds that that's that's significant they will need to own funds that are equivalent to uh, so they, they need to have their own funds, sorry, uh, equivalent to 3% of the total issued as a result of assets and with a minimum of 350,000 uh, euros. Uh, they must provide with a claim on the issuer and a redemption at demand, etc., etc. So uh, quite a lot of changes uh, compared to how the USDT is uh, operating today. Uh, and the last example I had was, uh, if, if you can go to the next slide, uh, the last example I had was, yeah, uh, yeah, and that's, that's an interesting case also because it's, it's, a, it's something that's really used uh, for um, interoperability between blockchains, right? A representation of an asset that is on another blockchain in, a, in, a, in another one. So you have, a, for example, WBTC, TBTC that are representational Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain, but you have other uh, use cases like that. And it's an interesting, interesting case because that's the, 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 the function of this is that it's basically an asset referenced token under the regulation. And this means that the issuers of those tokens uh, will need to uh, respect all the obligations regarding the asset reference tokens. Uh, the governance requirements, the, the reserve assets, um, the, the the plan to support an orderly wind down of the issuers activities, etc. etc. So, and the own funds also with uh, the of approximately the same amount, 350,000 euros or 2% of the reserve assets. Uh, and again, if you do not respect all those um, obligations, you are banned from being listed in a EU uh, trading platform. So uh, that's it for the um, uh, examples. Uh, and maybe we can uh, wrap up this presentation with a, a, an overview of the shortcomings and the, that we have seen right now on the regulation and the proposal that we have for improving uh, the, the regulation. Um, so I think this slide should not be here. Uh, yes, okay, yeah, no, no, it's good, it's good. It's just the title. Uh, so there's a buy and defy. 
that's something that we have uh, that we have uh, seen from the beginning uh, when reading the the regulation. Uh, we've seen that uh, the most of the DeFi and other decentralized use case of the blockchain space that are uh, basically the use cases that are growing the most, uh, where there's so many there's a lot of innovations and where. Uh, the, the new there's new assets that are listed in the US and in Asian exchange daily um, where there's a lot of funding where basically most of the uh, innovative activities happening right now on blockchain uh, will have a lot of trouble uh, with the new regulation uh, if it's implemented as this the first is uh, so I've, I've, we've seen it there's a, probably a ban on decentralized stable coins because they cannot respect the e-money token obligations which means approximately 20% of the DeFi market uh, is out of the European market. There would be a, a ban on decentralized representation of other crypto assets um, because they will fall into asset reference tokens. And right, again, because they are decentralized, they cannot uh, fulfill all the obligations. Uh, the regulated e-money tokens that could replace those uh, kind of assets uh, cannot uh, on you cannot serve interest on them, uh, which is a very very significant DeFi use case. I think approximately seventy percent of the markets are products that that includes the payment of interest from one party to the other, and they are probably economically not viable compared with, due to the the number of obligations that they have to to support. Um, and then there's the, uh, the mandatory issuance obligations that fall into all the assets uh, issued in the EU that are very difficult to respect for uh, decentralized use cases. So uh, probably for now, um, and that's our reading, of course, uh, it's not legal advice, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, DeFi assets are probably banned from, uh, from trading in the EU. Uh, this could, probably be changed. Um, so our proposed solution would be to find a way to exclude those use cases from the regulation uh, so that innovation can continue to happen. And those use cases are probably those who, who are the most dis disruptive, of course, to the uh, existing use cases, but also those who have the potential to bring the most uh, value short term. So that would be probably a good move for the uh, EU. Um, there's a few proposals that are very uh, uh, that that needs to be fine-tuned, but basically uh, there should be some rules. So where the issuer, for example, does not control the issuance, supply, no movements of a token because it's a completely decentralized token, then there should probably be no requirements that would prevent the issuance to take place and the CASP to list them. Um, and in this case, because you need to find uh, someone responsible for the listing, uh, of course, the CAS would be responsible for the due diligence process and should ensure that the protocol uh, and that the actual use case is sufficiently decentralized and that uh, it respects the characteristics that allow them to be listed. And you should probably find, could probably find uh, some similar exemptions for uh, stable coins. Uh, decentralized stable coins should be able to uh, should be able to be listed in um, in EU regulated entities if they respect some characteristics that get them uh, decentralized. Um, there's the point of the asset reference token that are a representation of another crypto asset that is present on another blockchain. Um, this use case being critical for interoperability uh, use cases between blockchains, it would probably be uh, interesting to find lighter rules for those uh, for those assets and then uh, that's the point of the interest um, yeah a lot of the DeFi use cases uh, for now on the on the on the decentralized finance are involving at some point the payment of interests of on uh, on assets uh, on asset reference tokens and on e-money tokens um, so that's something that would probably need to be reconsidered if there's a room for decentralized finance uh, in Europe. So that's it for uh, the DeFi. 
uh, we'll get back to uh, security tokens and DLTs. So the second challenge that we could identify uh, while reading the many pages of regulation is that we can uh, see a risk uh, for uh, open uh, DLT. Uh, why? Because some of uh, the rules and the conditions that are established uh, may refer to uh, private and proprietary technology. For example, uh, if you are a custodian, uh, you uh, must be liable to your clients for the loss of, uh, of their assets for any malfunction or hack. Uh, and there is no definition of malfunction. Uh, no, um, and uh, if you think about it, uh, it would mean that there are no um, attributable, um, there are all, all those malfunctions uh, should be attributable to the issuer. Uh, because we don't see any uh, circumstances under which uh, the custodian would not be liable to their clients. And if so, uh, it, is, um, it is not possible to be under a public uh, blockchain scenario because uh, with, the, with the public blockchain, uh, you cannot uh, have a control on many things uh, and uh, this would not be, uh, um, uh, this would not comply with this um, with this drafting. Uh, another example that makes us think about uh, this, uh, this challenge is that in the pilot regime, there are many references of uh, the DLT operated by, uh, um, by an entity, uh, meaning that it is not uh, a public blockchain, but uh, the blockchain of, uh, that was uh, uh, developed by this uh, infrastructure. Uh, so it's not really clear, uh, but uh, it's a threat that we could identify. And to be uh, sure uh, that DLT means uh, the largest uh, scope of technologies, uh, the best would be to redraft uh, those examples of uh, rules uh, to make sure that all use cases, even those that are deployed on public networks, uh, are uh, in the in the Mika and pilot regime uh, scope and uh, understanding. Thank you. Um, another thing that we have seen is that um, the proportionality that was uh, introduced in the text, because that was one of the main one of the objectives of the text to you know, to preserve innovation. Uh, by uh, establishing proportionality rules um, are effectively not really applicable to uh, most of the use cases that are existing today. Um, so, for example, you have an exemption for crypto assets issued to qualified investors only, uh, but most of the crypto assets are bought, of course, by, uh, by, the, by retail investors. And even, even so, uh, if you... If you uh, if you restrict the sale to the qualified investors only, uh, then after that you cannot move the, 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 the asset out of the hands of those qualified investors, which means that they will be uh, basically uh, useless out of the, the very specific market of those uh, qualified investors. Uh, there's exemptions for stable coins of issuance uh, under 5 million euros, but all the stable coins that exist currently uh, are already higher, have already higher, higher issuance than this. Uh, there's an exemption for algorithmic stablecoins, um, but those stablecoins are not really used by the market. There's an exemption for regulated entities from MECA rules to issue crypto assets, which is, of course, not an option for, for newcomers. And uh, there's uh, exemptions, uh, the, the exemptions to benefit from the pilot regime. Uh, are very uh, are very low and basically they will cap the innovation uh, leeway so there's probably a room for increasing those thresholds basically uh, to be exempted from rules when you have a, a small use case uh, or to have uh, proportionality on those rules uh, they'll provide either by providing additional exemptions based on uh, the, the newcomers' comparative advantages, or better considering the size and maturity of actors to adapt some rules. Uh, for example, the armed funds requirements that are quite high uh, could be lower for, for new actors that are just entering the market and then grow with the size. 
So that would probably help um, preserving innovation and uh, and relative to the risks that are really posed by those uh, entities. And for the last, uh, <coughs> sorry, go back to back to first thing. Sorry, uh, yes, so for the last challenge that we could identify, um, it's not really a challenge, but an observation that uh, in the current drafting of the EU uh, proposals, the access to crypto asset markets are uh, very facilitated for regulated entities. Uh, there are many waiver mechanisms that allow them uh, to easily uh, access the crypto asset markets. And those waivers are not uh, accessible to, uh, to newcomers. So for example, when you are a credit institution and you want to issue crypto assets, uh, you are exempted, exempted from the MICA rules uh, to uh, being authorized uh, to issue those crypto assets. When you are an investment firm and that you want to provide crypto assets uh, services, uh, if you already provide an investment service that is deemed as equivalent uh, as a, the crypto asset service, you are also exempted from uh, all the rules set by MICA to be authorized to do so. Uh, you also have, and that's really important, uh, a monopoly for credit institutions and e-money institutions because they are the only entities that are authorized to issue uh, e-money token. So if you are a newcomer, you must first be regulated as a credit institution or e-money institution to issue e-money stablecoin. And uh, it, obviously, it's, uh, uh, it's very complicated if you even want to uh, you need to uh, comply with those existing regulation and with Mika and you are beginning your business. So it seems quite uh, unlikely. And finally, a monopoly granted to regulated entities uh, to address the security token uh, market, because as we could see in the pilot regime, to be able to operate uh, on this market, you must be either an investment firm, either a market operator, uh, either uh, um, uh, the operator of a, of a CSD. Uh, so you must comply with the existing regulations before being able to ask for example, exemptions uh, from the financial regulation. That's why we could notice that uh, crypto asset markets uh, could be even e really easily accessible to crypto, uh, to uh, traditional actors, sorry. Uh, and at the same time, uh, in the drafting, there are many obstacles to newcomer to try to challenge those, uh, those uh, entities. Uh, for example, to be authorized, uh, it's very long. It's up to six months for stablecoin issuers. So uh, it, it's a very a big disadvantage if you consider that regulated entities then not need to get authorized. You have rules that are not proportionate, as uh, Simon could uh, could explain it just before, uh, like prudential requirements, for example. Uh, the additional compliant costs that arise from uh, MICA and possibly other existing regulation that a newcomer must, must apply uh, is a very big deal for uh, those uh, new entrants. Uh, they, even, uh, they will even need to uh, financially participate to their own supervision uh, and uh, that, that, that would be a, a big cost uh, for them. And so finally, to get access to uh, crypto asset markets, the newcomers must before access to traditional markets, because as we could see, you must be a regulated entity uh, to uh, operate on the security uh, token market, uh, or you have uh, an easier access when you are a traditional actor, uh, so uh, it's uh, it's uh, not what we can say uh, really innovation uh, friendly. So what are the solution? First, we should maybe question the waivers that are granted to traditional actors. Some are justifiable uh, for sure, but are all uh, legitimate. For example, uh, can we uh, can we are we sure that uh, an investment services is equivalent to a service that is pure crypto. Uh, to the contrary, maybe a pure crypto services is, 
is uh, uh, probably uh, easier to provide by uh, a newcomer. Uh, so maybe we should uh, think about restoring equal opportunities uh, to all actors that would like to access crypto, crypto asset markets. Uh, so new, newcomers, uh, in, including newcomers, uh, because they have comparative advantages uh, to deploy innovative use cases that maybe traditional actors don't have. For example, their understanding of blockchain and crypto assets, their potential to explore uh, decentralization and most innovative use case, their speed to innovate because they are more flexible, they are smaller, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, this raises the main uh, question regarding the EU uh, proposal. How do we want to build the EU crypto uh, markets do we really want do you do we sorry really want that only uh, traditional actors uh, build it have access to it or do we want to give a chance to the new entrants to creative people uh, that have innovative ideas and that think outside the box and differently and is is it the chance uh, for the European Union to become competitive and uh, to to be uh, the crypto the crypto economic era, uh, so that that's really the question that uh, that must be answered when we read at those uh, proposals. Thank you, thank you very much, Christine. So I think it's a it's a good conclusion. It's a conclusion, of course, because this is a draft uh, proposal, and we hope that uh, the, the issues that we have identified will be um, will be also identified by uh, the, the Parliament and by the Council, and maybe also by the Commission, and that uh, some amendments will be made to the to the original version to the text. So uh, now we have the project, uh, we are in September, and um, there's the whole EU legislative process that needs to be uh, implemented uh, before the Parliament and Council that will amend and vote uh, the text. And um, the final regime should apply only in 2021 or 2022. In parallel to this, and this is just a side note, uh, there's also an adjustment of KYC and ML rules apply, applied to uh, those actors that should be uh, presented uh, early uh, 2021. And this amendment that will, uh, of course, impact also the actors, uh, the crypto assets uh, service providers, will enter into force uh, to 2022 or 2023. Um, and I think that that uh, let's wrap up for the this uh, presentation of the EU regime, and we can go to the Q and A time. Uh, we already have a few questions on the um, on the on on, on the, uh, Zoom. So the first question uh, I will I will first answer my, the the written questions, and then. After that, you can uh, raise your hand if you want to answer, uh, if you want to ask another question. So the first question would be, uh, what is the, uh, okay. When the e-money token or a asset reference token is exchanged between qualified investors, what law should uh, apply? Uh, I don't have the answer to this question, so that would be very quick. Um, the other question is why they don't refer to stable coins. Uh, that's a good question. And the, the, so we've seen that the definition of uh, stable coins from the Commission is very uh, unusual. Uh, they refer to the reference price, so the, the objective of the token, and not the uh, what what's backing the the, the asset. And uh, I think that this it's because first the term stablecoin um, is uh, is not very welcomed by the the financial uh, actors because it it uh, and with by 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 the by the regulators in general because um, there's the idea that the 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 value is basically guaranteed to be stable, which is obviously not the case. So asset reference and e-money, it's like, it's more uh, uh, relative to the to the objective. Um, and then they, they really wanted to have those definitions who are really, really broad. We see that with the e-money token, for example, 
they really wanted to encompass is all the use cases that are referring to the euro. Um, so they had to have this new definition that is broader than, than what we usually think about when we think about stablecoin. Um, so there's a question about interest. So yes, uh, there's no interest on stablecoin as it would be considered as a, uh, so the question is, is it because it, they would be considered as security tokens if interest were served? Um, this is an interesting question. I'm not sure about that uh, because you can serve interest on money uh, without being qualified of security. Um, but uh, what's uh, significant and, and interesting to uh, see is that there's also this, a similar ban of interest on uh, e-money. So it's probably just a, a copy paste of, uh, of the regulation on, on e-money tokens. That's, that's why uh, it's important to, uh, to raise the issue uh, and to, to make it uh, understood. Um, there's a question about, uh, is there, are there an obligation to use private or proprietary blockchain under the EU pilot regime? So uh, that's probably the case, yes. Uh, that's something that, uh, that, we, that we have discussed uh, before. Um, there's a question about, uh, are the crypto assets considered as good um, on uh, on um, uh, inheritance, uh, right? So that's uh, also a good question. Uh, yes, uh, they are today. So they are considered as, as good. And uh, and they and the second question would would be a, a, a very specific uh, legal question. I, I won't be able to answer it. I'm sorry, Eleonard. Um, in so there's a question on nfts into which category uh for nft marketplaces that issue nfts um so nfts are excluded from uh the issuance uh, regulation specifically uh, nft marketplaces they are probably excluded too but that's a very good question we haven't uh, we haven't looked at it so that's something we will need to to uh, to cover in addition uh, and the last written question is are in games assets uh, so virtual assets in video games covered by those uh, regulations so um, probably not well if they are represented on the blockchain they are probably an nft so they are excluded and if they are not represented on the blockchain they are not a crypto asset so they will, they are probably not in the scope of the regulation um so that's it for the written question if there's uh if someone wants to ask a, a question uh, no, they can raise their hand. So you can uh, you can do this uh, on on Zoom directly, and then they can uh, allow you to speak. There's a new written question uh, regarding Article 68 bans. Is there a space for pseudonymous coins? Uh, so yes, uh, pseudonymous coins is uh, most of the coins. So um, there's no specific ban on, on, on pseudonymous coins. And uh, it's really anonymous enabled coins, so, which means coins that have specific properties that allows transferring these coins without uh, you know, disclosing the origin of these coins and the destination of the coins. So let's wait for maybe a few minutes for another question.
Well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much for your time. Um, and uh, for, oh, yeah, there's another question. There's two new questions, great. <laughs> um, do we have some insights on the, of the impact on AML CFT rules? Um, okay, so we know that the AML CFT rules will change for crypto assets. Uh, on another regulation. So there's no draft, no uh, nothing uh, for now uh, on those uh, on those rules. So we don't we don't have the details. We know that those rules will adapt from the uh, recommendations of um, the um, uh, of the uh, FATF, uh, GAFI in French, uh, and those recommendations are, are quite uh, detailed already. The detail. Uh, how the the rules should be implemented and also new obligations and namely there's a new obligation that's called the travel rule where uh you if you operate an exchange you need to collect information on your clients and then transfer them to your counterparties etc etc uh, there's technical uh, challenges to those rules but um, they should be implemented in the new uh, aml cft uh, directive so we uh, expect uh, the rules applied to those actors to be uh, more, more stringent than they are, than they are today. And what, what's, what's also uh, significant is that for now, the, the only actors that need to apply those rules are the custodians and the, the exchange. Uh, and that's something that should change also the, the old, of course, the actors that will be covered by uh, the EU regulation will fall into the uh, also the AML CFT rules. Okay, we have new questions coming. Um, so Marina asks if uh, I'm wondering what does a startup that has a token, like a utility or stable coin, uh, can do now, how to act? Okay, so how to act. Uh, you can help us. <laughs> uh, you can well you reach first. You can reach to us because we are trying to uh, coordinate uh, uh, a common action of the of the cryptocurrency uh, sector on this uh, on this text, and we we will uh, write down all the suggestions we have, all the the issues we have identified, and we will uh, co-sign with uh, the most. Uh, the biggest number of actors possible, uh, a, a position paper that would be um, that would be transmitted to all the relevant parties, so we can make our voices heard. And we have other uh, actions that are uh, planned in the next few few months. So yes, please reach to, reach out to us, and uh, we'll probably find a way to work together and to uh, and to make your voice heard with with ours. Um, Another question, could a fully decentralized project be declared illegal? Is there a mean for regulation to act on, sol on such decentralized projects? So yeah, uh, it's true that if you are fully decentralized, um, it's very difficult to block you, right? You, if, you, if you want to stop a decentralized use case, you have to stop uh, the blockchain, the underlying uh, blockchain, uh, which is probably not a good idea. Uh, because you will then ban the access to all the other assets and use cases that are hosted on this uh, blockchain. Um, there's a few things that could be done, like uh, preventing the access to the front end, like the, the website that allows you to, act to, to interact with the blockchain, but still this can be circumvented. I think that the most um, significant consequences for decentralized use cases is that they won't be able to, if the regulation stays as it is, they won't be able to uh, be normalized. They won't be able to be listed on, on centralized uh, exchanges. They won't be able to, um, centralized exchanges won't be able to interact with those use cases and then to provide their customers services linked to those decentralized um, applications. So it's basically that they would, it will become like a fringe use cases um which would be a shame um because there's probably interesting things to do uh with those uh, DeFi use cases uh in the eu thank you so another question um do you think that that official positions will be sent by paris europlas and other working groups to eu public institutions about mika and the pilot regime 
So I think so. <laughs> uh, we have been working with uh, Paris to define uh, common positions uh, on the financial sector in in, um, in France, uh, and we are in the process of finalizing a position on the pilot regime specifically. And it should be sent in the next few days uh, because uh, it's almost finished. Well, we we began the draft of this uh, position before uh, the regulation was out, so there's a few uh, amendments to do in in pure form. But uh, the the position is ready. So yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I think. I answered to, oh no, new questions. Um, concerning STOs, does it mean that tokenization of assets will be sharply restricted and we won't be able to tokenize real estate, plants, invest on projects, etc., etc.? So, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically, uh, what the clarification means is that yes, uh, tokenization of assets, uh, it's um, it's either if you are if you are tokenizing a security, then you are a security token. If you are tokenizing an asset, then you fall into the asset back, asset uh, asset uh, reference token. And asset reference token, you've you've seen that there's a lot of obligations. So it doesn't mean that you are restricted. Well, you, you cannot do this, but you will be you will need to be regulated under Mika, um, and to you know, issue a white paper uh, and provide all the other guarantees as an issuer of those um, asset back token uh, to be able to to issue them. So, yeah, it's not it's not per se a ban, um, but it's uh, still it will still make uh, your life uh, quite more difficult to issue them in the EU. Great. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Just to clarify, uh, that's a question. Just to clarify, they never used the B word, <laughs> Bitcoin, <laughs> and they are using DLT many times. So, yes, I confirm that uh, they are never, the word cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or Ether or any other uh, cryptocurrency is never mentioned in the document. Um, at the beginning, at, at first read, it, was, it wasn't really clear if those assets were really in the scope. But the definition of crypto assets is very broad. So yeah, they, they obviously fall in the scope of the regulation. But uh, it's not mentioned in the text. It's not mentioned in the introduction, like in the recitals. Um, so obviously, they wanted to avoid mentioning uh, cryptocurrencies where, when they were drafting uh, the, the regulation. The reasons are unclear, but they are. That's uh, that's just something we see. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Oh, under which condition would an ERC one thousand one hundred and fifty-five token considered an NFT? That's not a question I can answer. <laughs> I don't know what's the ERC 1155 uh, standard means. I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. I think that's all for the questions. Oh, no, there's still one. What about foreign actors? Can they sell into EU without complying to MICA? So um, there's, a, there's territoriality rules in the, in the regulation. So if you are directly targeting the EU market, which means that you are doing marketing to sell your assets in the EU, you need to comply with MICA. And uh, the, then you need to have a legal entity in the Europe, et cetera, et cetera. But if you are not doing marketing, uh, so you just do your own service, but then, then clients reach out to you. You open clients 
go to you to to buy your products then you uh you can sell them there's no ban and you don't have to comply to mika there's an exception to this and those are stable coins sorry uh e-money tokens that would be uh referencing the euro if you are referencing the euro then you absolutely need to comply with mika or you are absolutely banned from being sold uh in the in the eu so in general uh if you are not doing marketing in europe you can operate with european clients but if you are selling uh eu reference token like uh e-money token then you absolutely need to 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 register and to respect uh and to respect Mika. okay um so this is follow-up question. So if an EU citizen just go on Coinbase, problem solved. Uh, yes, if Coinbase does not provide, does not try to market uh, its services in uh, in Europe, uh, that that that's true. And I think. Uh, the last question will these regulations support more eu industries uh, i'm not sure i i fully understand the question um it's really focused on the crypto assets and the crypto assets issuers so it's it's not supposed to target other uh, other industries at least for now And that's it. I think uh, we're out of questions. So uh, thank you very much again um, for uh, listening to us. We uh, we will be very happy to answer your follow-up questions if you have some. We will also uh, publish uh, the uh, the slides uh, and a summary of this webinar in the next uh, few days. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have also issues with the regulation uh, would like to raise your voice uh, in the EU uh, on the content of the text and um, see you soon for the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye.